That's good. Isn't it harder to edit to start recording? Um, so I guess uh, I don't know how much of a point there is in in talking about Husky C since five of us were just on that meeting, but um, Rana was not. I don't think so. I can update you. Um, we are basically where it, the, there's two bills, and where it stands is. Um, HB 5001, uh, which is the speaker's bill, has a lot to do with uh, people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, that bill has two sections in it, which would adjust the Husky C income and asset limits. Um, that is opposed to HB 6630, um, which is, uh, a much more complete bill as far as uh, fully addressing the discrimination in our Medicaid eligibility standards against people with disabilities and people who are older than 65. Um, basically, the difference is that 5001 would contain uh, an income limit of a fixed dollar amount, which is highly unusual, um, of 1465 a month. Sheldon, just not along if that's correct. Okay. Um, and the uh, 6630 would have an income limit to match 138% of the federal poverty level. Um, that bill would also have asset limits of 10,000 and, and 15,000, whereas uh, 51 would have asset limits of 3,600 and 5,400. Um, clearly one of the problems with 5,001 is that the, um, specifically as far as the income limit goes, it's a fixed dollar amount, which like I said, is very unusual as far as uh, setting income limits. It doesn't adjust with time. It's just straight up the number of the income limit is written mm -hmm. into the law. Um, this is obviously a problem because with inflation that will erode over time and you know thousands of people can get kicked off the program each year because of that. Um, I should also just note that the reason that we were looking to go to 138% of federal poverty is because that is the income limit for uh, Husky D which of course is uh, the Husky program for people who are not disabled or 65 or older. Um, so this is really an issue of discrimination and we want to make sure that there's parity between those two income limits. Um, and it's not fair that people with disabilities are being discriminated against still. Um, you know, while 5001 would go you know, part of the way to addressing that. Um, I think the message that we really need to be sharing right now, and, and this is uh, Sheldon's words, not mine, but partial discrimination is still discrimination. So we are working on, uh, you know, messaging to the appropriations committee, messaging to the speaker's office and messaging to, um, you know, all other involved legislators, um, including Lucy Dathan, who uh, has uh, a lot of say in this bill, um, to make sure that we can can address this. Um, I don't know if Sheldon, you have anything else you wanted to add. Um, there is on 5001 a, a spending cap, it seems, of what was it, 100 million? Um, so that's going to be a hurdle that we need to cross, but it's not as if they can't do it. We just need to make sure that they can. And for the record, this this is something that has been done in other states, in California, in New York. Um, so we can certainly adjust this these income and asset limits. Uh, I'll just let Sheldon weigh in if he wants to. <laughs> The only thing I'll add is we learned at the meeting this afternoon that we are, we're having an impact. And so there is this between these two bills, raising to 1465 fixed amount and 
138% of poverty cover currently 1677, kind of big spread, $250 a month spread. But we learned today that it's in flux. And now the latest version of what's in that bill is 124% of the federal poverty level, which is about 1508. And, and it's not a fixed dollar, we're told, that mm. it's, it's this percentage. So that, that does solve the, you know, it doesn't go up with inflation problem, but it's still discrimination. Why are you, you know, you know, if I, if, if we said, I mean, <laughs> I know this is shocking, but if we said, well, you know, it's not so bad that we give black people less benefits than white people because we're increasing it. So it's not as bad as it was before. You know, that obviously would be completely unacceptable. Um, this particular kind of discrimination, sorry to say, is legal. It is, does not violate a federal or state anti-discrimination law, but there's all kinds of discrimination we all know exists in society that are not illegal. They're just wrong. And this is in the, the wrong category. Yeah. And so for Husky C, we, we really need to strongly message that, that it's still partial discrimination and partial discrimination is still discrimination. Um, there were a few really great articles that went out last week. Um, I think both in the current and the mirror, um, which uh, highlighted um, actually one of, one of the, uh, one of the plaintiffs, am I using the right legal word, Sheldon, in, she in the case that Sheldon was litigating um, on behalf of, uh, of folks who are about to get kicked off of uh, Medicaid due to the, um, it's the COVID unwinding protocol. Um, and certainly there's many, many people who are currently on Medicaid that, uh, if this was these income and asset limits were adjusted, they would be able to keep their coverage. And this is really important for keeping people, um, you know, able to live in their communities, get and receive the services and supports that they need um, in their own homes without having to go through the really disruptive process of being institutionalized to get those services. Um, so as, as far as Husky C goes, that is where we stand with that, um, which I believe was the main thing that Holly had asked me to talk about, but uh, I certainly can talk about other, um, especially of our mental health priorities uh, at Keep the Promise Coalition. So I'll Please. just pause for questions maybe first about the Husky C stuff. Oh, okay. I have kind of a fundamental uh, question. What drives uh, support for the bad policies. You know, it seems like we're always fighting against the bad policies, but it, it seems as though some of the things that switch from to, to 124% or linking it to a dollar amount, which is I think how we got into the fix we're in to begin with, was stating a dollar amount without adjusting. What, what's the motivation be, behind like doing things badly? Too many competing priorities. Yeah, I mean, well, and that's certainly what a lot of people will tell you in the, in the legislature too. Um, but there, fundamentally, there has to be political willpower to actually use the funds that we have in the richest state, in the richest country on earth. Um, so that we can, you know, bolster these very important, um, I mean, this, for example, is a medical assistance program. Why are we talking about the cost of a medical assistance program and trying to contain that cost? This is, this is healthcare. Um, and I think this group, you know, fundamentally agrees with that sentiment. Um, so it's, it's frustrating and it's not a matter of, in my opinion, like, this thing versus this other thing needs to be funded. Um, we can fund all of these things. It's just that the people that are very, very high up need to, to be willing to do so, um, which is not always politically expedient. I'm wondering 
wondering if uh, David has any thoughts on that. <laughs> Are you there? I'm not sure if he heard you. Rep Michelle, Maggie would like to know if you have any thoughts on um, <laughs> why this isn't happening. Media. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, well, when uh, Rona asked the question, the immediate thing that came out of my mouth was money and special interests. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hmm, that's an odd question. <laughs> I mean, I'm joking. But uh, uh, yeah. Um, but nice, nice to hear uh, from you, uh, Jordan. And uh, I'm just here listening in. I uh, I missed a bit of the beginning. I came in late, so uh, I don't want to be off subject as I usually am. <laughs> no, you're okay, Rep. Michelle. We always appreciate you being here. We're just talking about Husky C, and um, you know what what's going on with that right now between language that we suggest and language that they're trying you know the powers that be are are trying to stick with but we are making some ground we think so it's good it's good yeah okay. there's definitely more so on this on the state single parent there's definitely a lot more attention than it was two even four years ago for sure it, as as we continue pushing even if it had less um legislative activities say uh the conversation is there and then on the expansion of husky that's like where the disappointments are well the chair is in favor so we're lucky that we have better chairs this year for human services uh that's that's one of the very 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 few committees that i'd say <laughs> is looking better uh and i'm not on that committee uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I could make some comments about things. Getting my uh, Layla staff. One, one for me, one for John. But um, uh, yeah, the the human service is much is very lucky actually because with um, uh, and it's not personal, but when Kathy Abercrombie was chair, and things were just dying. <laughs> we still have a couple of. Uh, players that are very loud on the democratic side and not very friendly uh and uh you know i guess we have to work harder you know it's funny for example we're working on a food access uh bill right for the food advocate so i i have this idea of since they're all talking it's going to take so much money and six people it's going to die so i'm like okay but then there's people who don't have access to food so i was like well why don't we uh, add the food advocate uh part of wcseo which is the commission for women seniors sorry about that a commission for uh, women seniors uh, children equity and opportunity uh he has like eight people in his office that do each of those things and then they get fellows in the during the the, the session so it's it's like it's one salary not six people we're not and it's still an independent commission because that's very important when it's independent it's much better when they have their own uh you know their own say um and uh i think uh, steven hernandez is a, a, a jewel for the state so he runs this commission like it should be so <laughs> yeah. uh but and then i i, I heard so after that, that that's michelle could a very good um piece of information that i never thought to to kind of tap into so that's kind of a place to go to have a discussion um absolutely, for, absolutely. especially those you know i don't know it's it's good i don't know hey, you so know, that's a very good part of piece that. Yes, you know, yes, food access, equity and opportunity, especially for those people with um, disabilities, which is what Husky C is, is uh, discriminating against with their ridiculous asset and income limits. So yeah, yeah. Well, I, was, I was pointing out that even somebody who's not friendly to our fights usually, suddenly we hear that rep cook is organizing oppressive about food access I'm like what uh well we have a bill <laughs> you know and uh she goes oh okay oh oh and we found out it's the same reason we're 
that she's doing that presser as we are actually working on this bill with Reggie from uh, uh, Fridgeport. Uh, he's been working on this with like uh, more than 20 orgs for like a couple of years. And uh, I mean, this is, this is interesting. Sometimes you get with strange bedfellows. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you and hear so, of any you know. photos, certainly let us know because I never thought of the the commission on everything as some people refer to it. That's that's a really good point. So thank you for sure. Also, thank you. It, it also gives hope because if Reb Cook is willing to go this way, like with a pushing for a food advocate, because somebody in her district. Or a couple of people have talked about some issues with the Connecticut Food Chair or the Connecticut Green Bank. Um, well, then it gives me hopes that maybe if we work on our constituents to push for at least getting the study, I don't yeah. think we'll get her past that. But if we can get her to support the study, that's mm -hmm. a major step, and that will go much further. Um, anyway, sorry I, again. That's I went okay. In a bunch nope. of tangents. It, it, all, it all intersects. Everything intersects, Rep. Michelle. We appreciate you. Thank you. Absolutely. And um, I mean, I think we, we've got a small enough group that we can probably, I'm, I'll, I could be conversational too about this. Um, and by the way, I was in the room for um, Reggie's testimony on that food advocate bill. And, oh my, that was the first time I heard of Bridgeport, but wow, I love those guys. <laughs> oh. Reggie rocks. He's the king. Yeah. He's yeah. He, he really is. He's, he's, what he's doing is phenomenal. I mean, I, I never I even thought about it. Just a fridge where people just go in and like food comes in, food goes out every day. Yeah. It's great. You know, right now we're debating about, you know, the, the free meals in schools. Well, school is one way of access to food, right, for children. But then that's why we need that food advocate in a CWCSEO, because that's going to be related to ch women, seniors, children, and equity and opportunity. That's it's the whole thing. Um, so um, maybe there's some work we can do on the state single payer side with Stephen Hernandez, but. Um, yeah, definitely the expansion of us key. He's absolutely, you know, I don't understand why we're limiting ourselves. $15 million for up to 26, but we have the cap and we can't blow the cap and, and this, and there's only 50 or 60 million available for 20 amazing humane services issues. But you know that's BS. You know the cap is BS. Yeah. But anyway, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have interrupted so much. I'm sorry. I didn't no, get it's it. No, it's BS. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's bullshit. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yep. I'm trying to pay yeah. because my mother actually watches these YouTube videos, by the way. She's probably one of three and I'm two of three. <laughs> so she does watch the video. So I have to watch my mom. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think there's uh, a lot of agreement amongst advocates about uh you know the frustration with with having that cap and and again just having the political willpower to, to actually fund the services that we need um and uh you know i think another one of our i'll, I'll start talking about our mental health priorities now at ktp um uh and i'll talk about two in particular um one of them was that we were really pushing uh, hard on insurance reimbursement, specifically uh, starting with Medicaid reimbursement for peer support services. Um, there were two bills um, that would have uh, introduced reimbursement uh, for peer support services. One of them was through the insurance committee um, that was not uh, dealing with Medicaid, it was dealing with certain private insurance plans. Um, that bill is dead now. Uh, it contained a lot of other insurance mandates, and I thought those were all wonderful things that should be included. Uh, but of course, the, the trouble is when you have so many things in a single bill, it, it could also increase the lift of, of passing it. Um, the other bill was SB 1205, and that had a hearing um, 
earlier in March in the uh, Human Services Committee. Um, that bill would have uh, required the commissioner of DSS to amend the state Medicaid plan uh, to reimburse for peer support services. Um, and peer support services, for those who don't know, are very important and a valuable part of our mental health system. Um, they're provided by people who have their own lived experience of recovery from a mental health condition or substance use disorder. Um, and what is really, really important about them is that they're non-clinical and it relies on the expertise of those individuals who have been trained in, in various uh, types of compassionate and uh, uh, um, respect-based um, approaches to mental health. Um, it can almost be thought of like having a sponsor in a 12-step program, but it is really, I think, uh, in a lot of ways, a lot more um, of a profession. And that's what we're trying to make it, is we're trying to make it a sustainable profession for the many people who have put in time uh, in their recoveries and have found meaning in helping other people recover. Because a lot of people are doing this in Connecticut now on a volunteer basis uh, entirely. Um, and you would not believe the hours that that some of these folks put in, um, you know, working on a volunteer basis overnight, um, 18 hours with a single person, um, peer services really uh, ought to be a, a funded service and those people should be paid and recognized for the work that they do. Um, not to mention that they are incredibly helpful. It's an evidence-based practice. Um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services recognize them as such. And um, unfortunately, the bill that, that we really supported, 1205, which would have made those services reimbursable, is dead. Um, one of the provider agencies uh, was really strongly opposed to it. Uh, due to concerns that they had about how Medicaid funding would affect the delivery of services. Um, I think the really important point in response to that is that we need flexible funding. And we, in no sense, and this the bill that that appeared this year in no sense or any way would have taken away the funding that they are those programs are already receiving from Demas. In fact, there are many cases where that type of state funding is preferable depending on the specific uh, setting in which peer services are offered, the model that's being used, but certainly for the many uh, providers that are hiring peers um, using small grants or out of their own pockets, this will provide for a lot more peer positions and, and for funding peer support services. Um, so one thing that, that we at Keep the Promise are looking to do in the future is to organize the peer recovery community. So uh, in a similar way that uh, to the, the way that community health workers have been organized um, so that there can be a unified voice on peer support uh, and the issues surrounding it in the future. Um, and that's something I'm hoping we can get started with this summer or early this fall. Um, but for now, we're, we're going another year without reimbursement for peer services. And I see Rhett Michel has his hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say I'm a little frustrated with this because I've, I've actually introduced this peer, su peer support being covered by insurance in my first year, 2019. And uh, 2021, I'm pretty sure I did. And I think I also did it this year. I, but you know what they do? They, I don't know why they make it, the, they change, they take the same thing, they do the same thing in their another bill number. So, but I'm, I'm sorry to hear that it, it failed again. I should check on 1205. I, for some reason, I don't think I even flagged that bill myself. Uh, or I might be co-sponsoring it already. I've co-sponsored so many bills that 
I don't remember if 1205 is one of them. Well, I do remember, I, I remember I saw a bill um, that would have required peer support reimbursement this year that I, I think you introduced. And I wanna take the time to just say that we do really appreciate that. Um, and while I don't think that bill made it very far, the other ones that did make it further also died. So, you know, we appreciate the effort and we're, we're gonna keep going because that's all we can do here. Did 1205 go through a public hearing? It did, Yes, right? it did, yes. yeah. So, so then it's not really dead. I'm on my fifth year now, so I'm learning more. Um, it's dead, but if there's support from the chair, or one of the chairs in some way, as long as neither chair really hate it or want to, don't want to hear about it, there's a way to bring it back. It could be as a draft LCO for any other bill that has that has things in mental health coverage. And a draft LCO would be for an amendment. I say draft because if it's filed, it's going to war. So you draft it. It gets drafted by a legislator, not drafted by a legislator. We know we don't draft anything, but it's the LCO that drafts the, 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 the language uh, upon our request. So we could find a champion to request LCO to draft the language that's needed. And that would be a new section, a whole new section in another bill that's of cognizance to uh, human services. Uh, or, or, or not even to human services, basically to uh, um, uh, to uh, behavioral health support. And I'm pretty sure there has to be a couple of bills that are waiting on either floor um, or that are in the on the calendars. So um, the the key is be very careful. The legislator who does that has to be careful whose bill he's offering an amendment to because then he would have to also clear it with a proponent of that bill. So it's not easy, but it's not dead. <laughs> a year ago or two years ago, I kept saying, oh, I keep reviving those bills. No, it's just that they're not really dead. <laughs> they appear dead, but they're not really dead. So, and you know, leadership, like for example, I was pushing for this, I'm pushing still now for this offshore wind thing that would uh, require environmental and, um, and labor creation standards in the bidding process for offshore wind to, our, to the developers, which makes absolute sense. Uh, so I'm getting support from the speaker and from the minority leader, which is, you know, this is big, uh, but <laughs> I don't have support from Senator Dealman, who is the Senate chair of energy. So just to give you that idea that one chair can literally hold it down and keep it all the way till the end. So it's really dead. Yes, it's possible. But he made some mistake. I have some emails that might show that he might be uh, in the pocket of Eversource and uh, Orsted. And so <clears throat> he might want to be careful with pushing back against such a nice effort for our state. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so there's ways, but, you know, this is like, this is when the politics really start happening. Yeah, so, and that's an excellent and important point. And, and maybe that's that's the strategy we need to take. We have been um, we have been sending emails to the committee chairs about it uh, at the very least, but maybe we're due for another round. Yeah, I think I actually that? I actually got an email back from the chair who told me they would have been happy to pass the bill had it not been for one of the voices that was so loud against it, which we know was CCAR. So if we can get CCAR on board, I don't think anybody would have a problem passing this, but I don't wanna hijack this, this whole, but they um, did say that that's what they said. Yeah. Who is CCAR? Um, the Connecticut Community for Addiction Recovery. Um, they're one of the peer organizations that provides peer support services. And that is like, you know, that's strictly their thing is peer support. Um, they 
they had concerns about how the bill would affect uh, how they are able to provide peer support services. And, okay. um, you know, I, I won't deny the fact that Medicaid billing comes with certain requirements and complications, but it doesn't eliminate the, um, the, the more sort of, um, uh, we'll use this not in the political sense, but the more liberal funding that they receive, which allows them to do, um, you know, the, the, the kinds of things that they really feel are necessary for peer support. Um, this would this bill would just be a way of expanding the profession, funding it uh, to a greater extent, um, which is definitely. It sounds, it sounds like they don't necessarily understand the bill, then, and they're just in opposition because it it could they they're in fear that it might have an impact on. on okay, I, I see that happens often, um, but if this can be fixed, like. I'm just going to like put some crazy time frame, but like if it can be fixed within a week, week and a half, like to actually have a talk with them, week and a half to two weeks, and I can jump on the call, I can probably bring Ann Hughes and maybe some others, and so that we can meet with them also and, and support you in, in, in requesting for their support. And then if they give us support, they'll be like, yeah, but the bill is dead, then we'll have it, that's when the danger comes is do we reveal that the bill might not be dead <laughs> the, but we, that's why we have to make sure we get their support if we have it then it's then it helps because if that's the voice that has suppressed it then and what, what i don't understand is a, a loud voice will convince the chairs not to pass a bill but the the chairs must know the language so and so here was the uh, <laughs> who were they uh, which which committee was this in was so this, this was in human services, services. And I was there okay. for the hearing um ccar is very very staunchly opposed to it and they have they have been consistently opposed to reimbursement um in the past i um i want to keep con you know continue uh talking with because them. it creates competition for them right but Right. I think that, that could very I, well be part of I it. I really, you know me, I really think this bill, I mean, what happened to the community health workers uh, bill? Did, are they getting a reimbursement? Uh, right. As of right now, that's moving forward, it looks like. Um, and there were a lot of um, a lot of compromises between the folks who had concerns about the reimbursement mechanism, not about specifically reimbursing uh, community health workers, which I think you know, all, all of us support. Um, but I, it should be moving forward um, with with agreeable language now. Um, but as far as peer support goes, I mean, I was in the hearing for that for that. I was in the room for that hearing. Um, I think See, I, you know, I don't think we should give up on this, even at this point. No, it's a different for this session, even because, as you said, I worked mental health agencies. If we can talk to CCAR, it's not going to affect them. It's only going to increase like the community mental health and the clinics to be able to hire more peer support because you can't bill Medicaid unless you've got, you know, a whole medical model. Because I mean, it's it's really not going to affect them <laughs> at all. And especially I don't especially when we have, especially when we have chairs that say that they're supportive of it. That's yes, crazy. yes. Um, and I'm I'm happy to talk to them. I don't think, um, just being realistic, I don't think they're going to come around before the bill happens. But part of the reason that that what we um, as KTP are trying to do is get peer support uh, workers organized. Part of the reason for that is because if you'll, you, you take a look at the list of people historically who have testified in support of, of Medicaid reimbursements, whether it be this bill specifically this year or other attempts to do so in the past, um, CCAR may have opposed it, but all of the recovery coaches that they've trained are standing up in support of the bill saying 
you trained me and I want to get paid to do what you trained me to do. So that could also be, you know, a, a really important part of the approach is making sure that we have broader um, support outside of just the this one provider agency that's making noise about it. Um, that's more of a long term uh, approach, but um, and I did take the opportunity to try and address uh, some of those concerns uh, when I testified on that bill. I went shortly after some of the folks from CCAR, but um, I, it was enough to to at least freeze the bill <laughs> as it is, and, and you know, hopefully, we can do something about it this year. But if not, we're we're not giving up. Other questions about peer support? I'm sorry about that. Or... That's okay. You're good. <laughs> Just be safe, okay. please. What? Yeah. Other questions about peer support, or I can move on to the, the last big thing that I was going to update everyone on. Uh, I, I would just say, just, just, just to finish on that, I would just say that then the debate has to happen with the chairs to say that, to explain to the chairs that CCAR fears or that, but the bill does not do that and, 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 and expressively show it in the language. Uh, and that, that can help. I mean, every right. every bit of work helps on the, on this and can give it a life. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. David, what bill would if uh, what bill is still alive? Where is the other Medicaid uh, funding and amendment stuff like the community uh, health workers? What what big bill is it in? Um, for the community health workers, I believe the bill is SB ten. Uh, that will okay. probably be the one that moves forward. Um, okay. Well, so I, we there's a lot of different things in that bill. It might right. be a vehicle, but it might be more appropriate for it to go in one of the mental health related bills, which there are a few of. Okay. Well, maybe sometime this week, Jordan, we could we can talk about which of those bills are because I'm going to be talking to some people. I mean, the the clinical nonprofit people would like to have this in their bag of tricks. If they could bill for more peers, I mean, they have peers now, all the community regional mental health agencies have peers, but they're, they're through funding, they're not billable. And they can, I mean, you know, get some support to, uh, and I, you know, I don't know. I can talk to Kristen. It's worth at least still talking to McCarthy Vehi and and Jillian uh, Gilchrist and Ann Hughes and those folks. So I mean, I don't think even if it's just building for the next time, because the nonprofit community is in favor of this because it's a way they can provide more services and pay, and they're the only ones that are gonna care about Medicaid funding. Your grassroots agencies aren't gonna do that because you don't want, you're not gonna have a psychiatrist. It's not gonna be medically necessary. Medicaid is a billable medical service and it just supplements. It doesn't threaten anybody else, but it, so I don't know. I feel very strongly about it. I've worked with peers for a long time. They need to be there and they need to be paid. And that's Absolutely. Not people people know how to how to do the impossible, but you got to give them some tools. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, Sheldon's got his hand up, and uh, Rep. Michelle, is your hand up still up from before? No, <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, Sheldon. Uh, since um, since Maggie raises, I think it's really important for you to know that SB 10 is really problematic for CHWs um, and that instead there's a much better bill on CHWs 991. Whenever you're talking to legislators about SB 10, you should make clear that sections 11 and 12 are highly problematic and should be removed and should be replaced with 991. And, and the, the short version of this, we don't need to take up time, but the short version of this is that nine, that SB 10 would effectively 
set things up for payment for CHWs to be on a financial risk basis. In other words, alternative payment methodologies where you put financial risk on providers and have an incentive to deny care. And that is how CHWs would be paid for. And the reason we say this is that the section 11 and 12 and SB 10 are all about linking to OHS, the Office of Health Strategy. And the Office of Health Strategy's primary care roadmap, which you may remember Maggie from last year, Yes, the, primary, the primary care roadmap says expressly 28 times, we need to move to prospective payment, which nobody knows what it means, but in footnote 15, they tell you, prospective payment is a fancy new word for a word that's disfavored, capitation. So it means the same thing as capitation. The primary care roadmap intends capitation providers and intends and says CHWs will be paid through capitation. That is the agency that the bill says should guide the development of the payment model for CHWs. So we pushed really hard. Several of us testified against that. And the result is that 991, which was an earlier, has been substituted. The original 991 was just a short little bill that said there shall be a state plan amendment to pay for CHWs. That's what it said. There shall be a state. The DSS shall get a state plan amendment to pay for CHWs. And <laughs> certain advocates who supported that bill and testified in favor of it actually said, no, we don't like this bill at all. We like SB 10, sections 11 and 12. And we looked at those sections 11 and 12 and saw all the problems with this. And the result is that 991 was gutted and it now has decent language. So for example, no reference to OHS. The no, OHS has nothing to do with this. This is gonna be just a DSS thing which is what federal law requires, by the way, because DSS is what's called the single state Medicaid agency under federal law. No other agency has any rights to have policies related to, to, to Medicaid, only DSS. Second, it uh, strangely, the bill as written in sections 11 and 12 has input into the design of what, this, what the payment methodology is gonna be only by CHWs. Only the providers. Do you know of any other system design where only the people are going to, the providers are going to, as great as they are, but do you know of any other system where only the providers get to decide how they're going to be paid and what the deal is? Of course, that there's something wrong with that. So the language now provides that advocates for people with disabilities of all kinds shall be equally on the same par as CH. At least we have some consumer advocates, obviously, in that. Um, on the same part of the CHWs in designing the, the model. And third, maybe most importantly, is it prohibits the, me the payment methodology from involving any financial incentive for other providers not to prescribe CHWs. So under the OHS model, there's absolutely every incentive for the, for the providers not to prescribe CHWs because it comes out of their pocket, dollar for dollar. That's what capitation means. You get a fixed dollar for dollar and everything you pay for, you pay for. So that would prohibit that and, and other kinds of financial risk models. So that's the third thing. And that's why this other minor change, but that's the reason why it's so important 991. My personal view is that as much as and this is being recorded, so I have to be careful. <laughs> but my personal view is if SB 10 with sections 11 and 12 were to pass as is, that will do more damage to the Medicaid program than if we pass nothing. If we don't have CHWs, that's better than passing that because that, that language will open up the door to imposing financial risk broadly, as bad as we have it already, um, this would be much worse in the Medicaid program. So I hope you will be saying, do not pass sections 11 and 12, um, do SS, uh, SB 991. I am working on a sign-on letter that's going to say that, so people don't have to individually say it, but um, you should know that going forward whenever you talk about CHWs. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sheldon. Um, do, do you know where, where we stand with the the agreed upon changes to those sections that you had mentioned? Yes. So what, well, what happened was that there was an agreement. <laughs> it was a negotiated deal. And, and I have to admit that this was a negotiated deal among advocates. 
So the vast majority of advocates, health advocates in Connecticut are opposed to quote unquote value-based payment and quote unquote alternative payment methodologies, which sound wonderful, but means putting financial risk on providers so financial instead of to lower the cost of their own patient's care. That's what it means. And DSS said that in their presentation to the medical assistance oversight group. Um, that's, you know, fundamentally, that's what's that's what's going on. And and a small one or two groups like support that, think that's great, and have even said and testified out loud publicly <laughs> on record that there's no risk of harm at all whatsoever from those kinds of financial risk models. When the whole point is to put financial risk so they have a dog in the fight to lower costs. So to say, oh, there's no problems, no risk with that whatsoever, especially in the climate where people, black and brown people already suffer under service. Why are we incentivizing more under service? I'm not getting it. Anyway, that was the conflict. And the way it was brokered is that they didn't want to mess with SB 10 coming out of human services. So they kept it as is, the bad language in sections 11 and 12, but they simultaneously passed SB 991, which had all the language I just summarized. And on the record, Matt Lesser and the others said, here's the plan. The plan is that 991 is going to substitute for sections 11 and 12. They both came out of human services that way, I guess, two weeks ago, and now it goes to the floor. And that's scary because are they really going to do that? Even though Matt Lesser said it, um, one of the purposes of our sign-on letter is to solidify that that was said <laughs> in order to make clear that that's what we're expecting because the advocates on the other side do not agree with us at all and are happy to push and are proud to push alternative payment models. So we have an unfortunate um, conflict within the health advocacy community. Okay, uh, so thanks, Sheldon, for for the update on that. Um, and I might need to borrow a few extra minutes from people here. It's eight o'clock and time, right? I'll, I'll try and be quick. Um, so our last priority is something called peer run respite, um, and basically, what the the background for why this is this is something we care about is that. Um, among our broader mental health system, we have this, this sort of branch of services that you could call crisis services. And those are for people who are experiencing a mental health crisis. Uh, so that is a, a time where people are, you know, at a heightened risk of suicide. It's, it's a pretty delicate and, and important time. Um, and making sure that people are able to receive the appropriate services during that time is really important to making sure that that risk is mitigated and that they can uh, walk a successful path to recovery in the future. Um, the problem is in Connecticut, we have we have a couple of really great things, including, um, you know, we now have the 988 uh, hotline. We have um, mobile crisis services, but we don't really have any really good places for people to go once they actually make contact with mobile crisis. Um, you know, you would you would think about this as, as sort of like, uh, well, people can go to the hospital, they can go stay in inpatient psych, or they can go to an emergency room setting. Um, the problem with that is that most people who enter into those hospital settings don't have the best experience in the hospital. And the reason is that the model is not really intended to facilitate recovery. It's intended to mitigate risk, right? So you could enter a hospital uh, inpatient psych, they might put you in a locked ward, you might see a social worker for uh, you know, a fixed amount of minutes per day, you might see the doctor for even less time. Um, and you are in a cold, uh, blank, empty room with a bed in it. And, you know, it's, you're there to be in a safe place. But the problem is there's a ton of research now that shows that people who are emerging 
uh, and being discharged from hospital settings for, um, for mental health crisis or crises are actually at a very persistent high risk of dying by suicide when they leave that hospital setting. Um, this is a huge problem. And in Connecticut, we really believe that, that we deserve better options. Fortunately, um, much in line with the principles of peer support services that I talked about earlier, there is a program that exists in, I believe now, at least 15 other states, although the number is likely more than that, um, which is called peer run respite. Um, and what you can think of these as uh, is essentially a mental health bed and breakfast. Um, people are admitted entirely voluntarily. Um, they won't usually won't accept anyone who is being forced to go there. They can walk in and out as they please. They can go to work during the day if that's what they choose. They can go back home to their family at night if that's what they choose. They can receive 24 seven support from peer support specialists who work there, who are trained in things like alternative to suicide and uh, wellness recovery action planning. These are programs that are developed with patient, with you know, the person's consent in mind and, um, really develop to have productive conversations about recovery and help people find their own path to recovery. And what we know um, from all of the surrounding states that have peer-run respites is that they're extremely successful. People are far less likely to uh, readmit themselves to a hospital after staying at a peer-run respite. They report having much better social and emotional coping skills, um, even better outcomes with their housing uh, in follow-up surveys. So this is something that's missing from our continuum of care in Connecticut. And it is something that we believe really uh, needs to be here. Um, we have a great example in Massachusetts, as, as well as all of our neighboring states have these, but Massachusetts has a really great example in Afia House, um, which we have modeled our, um, our sort of request uh, on. The, uh, there's, there was good news, which is that Demas has uh, put out an RFP for a peer respite. Um, However, that, that was just released yesterday. Um, however, we, we do feel that there are quite a few problems with it. Um, mainly, uh, you know, one of the big things is that the idea of a respite is that it takes place in a home-like environment. So you could find one of these just in a residential neighborhood, for example. Um, and it'll look like a house that anyone could live in. Um, it's designed to be a comfortable place for people uh, where they don't have to feel like they are in a medical or clinical setting, um, which can evoke trauma for a lot of people. Um, Demas in its RFP has already identified a site located at the um, Southeast Connecticut Mental Health Authority campus, which is a clinical facility. Um, even if the purpose of the respite was not clinical, uh, I don't believe that that setting is a good setting for it. They've also in their RFP excluded folks who are being discharged from the hospital um, for eligibility for the respite, at least immediately following their discharge. When we look to other respites, and I use uh, AFIA a lot as an example in Massachusetts, um, when we look to other respites, we find that the majority of people who are staying at those respites um, and are benefiting from them are people who have had prior experience with hospitalization. Um, so excluding that group of people uh, from, from eligibility immediately post discharge is a huge problem. Um, there are other problems with it. It doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to really um, prioritize providers that have a lot of experience with peer support services. It also for, uh, would require guests to share bedrooms just based off the fact that the facility has three bedrooms and the RFP requires 
making room for six beds. Um, that's a huge problem, uh, especially considering, you know, when we talk about trauma informed care, um, folks who are, would be utilizing the respite, um, could be coming from, you know, many different backgrounds, potentially, uh, having a lot of trauma. Um, and, you know, if someone is a survivor of sexual assault or domestic violence, um, or if that person is maybe um, a gender minority, they might not feel safe or comfortable sharing a room with a stranger. And, you know, when we talk about why respite is so effective, it's, be it's in part because it's based on the understanding of trauma-informed uh, care and trauma-informed responses to mental health. And so if you're creating an environment where someone doesn't feel safe, that's not going to be an effective uh, place for them to make their way towards recovery. Um, so those are a few of the big concerns with the RFP as it stands. Um, we are going to keep our eye on it and we will likely uh, figure out our, our next course of action within the next couple of weeks. But, um, you know, I, I'm definitely disappointed by the RFP. Um, I think Connecticut could do a lot better. Um, and, you know, for the record, we've done a lot of research about this. We have a, a working group that's put in a lot of time. A few of you are, have been involved with that. And, um, you know, we believe that this could be a really cost-effective option, especially as it pertains to keeping people out of the hospital, which is just incredibly costly. Um, DPH reported that in 2021, the mean, uh, the median rather cost of inpatient uh, psychiatric hospitalization was around $27,000. I've heard of it going much, much higher. I, I've heard of people who have had to pay like, uh, or been liable for 65-ish thousand dollars, um, whereas a respite would cost you know, somewhere around $3,000 for a week. Um, so we can do this in a very cost-effective manner. Um, we can do this in a way that's more effective than what we have now. It's, again, just an another question about having the political willpower to do it. And I think what we need to go for and pursue next year is um, a real solid legislative ask. The state of Massachusetts um, had a, a few bills this past year, um, one of which is still uh, active, uh, which would have established 14 peer run respites in Massachusetts, two of them um, specifically for LGBTQ plus people. Um, so they have clearly seen how successful that model is. Um, and, you know, we can, we can, I think, borrow from that as we move forward next year. Um, because we definitely need to provide some clarity in statute about what these things are supposed to look like um, so that we don't end up with uh, the, the disappointing RFP that, that was released uh, yesterday. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to advocate for that, but that is where we stand with, uh, with Peer Run Respite now, which was uh, our other priority that I really wanted to talk about tonight. Okay. So, um, Rana had put some important things in the chat. If you guys could take a look, that'd be great. Um, from Professor Gerald Friedman, and then from OutCT's Mental Health um, and Wellness Symposium. One is on April 26th, and one is on April 28th. They're very, very important um, things for our group, for our people. Um, so please check them out. And Professor Professor Friedman is amazing. So um, he's like the guru on single payer. So if you guys are able to go to that event, please do so because hopefully he'll give us some more oomph to go forward and move forward. And I thank you, thank you, Jordan, so much for your time. And I thank everyone so much for sticking around with us for a little bit longer. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. And I'll probably see most of you tomorrow. <laughs>
Thank you guys so much for having me on tonight. Um, glad to see a lot of familiar faces. Oh, good.